So excited about today's episode. I am sitting here with the Dr. Carol George, and we are going to traverse the conversations from, um, if you are a student of attachment, interested in, in any level, one of our neuro nerds, as we like to say, then pull up a chair. This is going to be a fantastic conversation. So how about we start with, can you just, for those of you, for those who aren't familiar with you, can you kind of give us a uh, thumbnail of uh, who you are today? And then we'll dig in. Then we'll dig in. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, today, I am retired professor from Mills College. Uh, my official title is Professor Emerita. I also have a distinguished research fellow position at Mills. Um, while I was at Mills, I taught undergraduates and graduates and had one of the first attachment courses, uh, yeah, one of the only ones in the country, aside from uh, the course that was being taught at UC Berkeley by my former advisor. Uh, I also co-directed the uh, Mills College Infant Mental Health Program for 21 years until I retired. Um, I work all over the world. I, I, I still teach. I don't teach undergraduates right now. I'd love to do that again. Um, but I teach graduate students and uh, mostly professionals like you who are listening to this podcast. Um, I have authored some books uh, and edited some books with my dear colleagues. Uh, Judah Solomon, some of you may doc know Dr. Judah Solomon's work. She and I edited two books on attachment disorganization um, from Guilford and then the Adult Attachment Projective Picture System with Dr. Malcolm West, who unfortunately is no longer with us. I'm an assistant editor on the Attachment Human Development Journal. That keeps me busy. And I direct the Adult Attachment Projective Training Consortium, which is international. Um, at present, most of my work is uh, consultation, working with clinicians in uh, small groups. Sometimes I do some online teaching uh, aside from training, but usually small groups working with the AEP. So that's who I am today. Wow. So exciting. Can you hear <laughs> the depth and breadth of uh, expertise that is here today? So one of the, just again, the, as a teaser, we're going to get into the difference between adult attachment uh, research and some of the developmental stuff. We are going to talk about this organization in particular. Um, it was Dr. George's it, for some reason, I don't want to call you Carol. Um, That's fine. Call me Carol. <laughs> I was saying, I'm, but I'm resisting it for some reason. Um, how about if I just call you? Maybe, maybe what's coming out of my mouth is Dr. George. Is that okay? That's just fine. Whatever's comfortable for you. <laughs> um, uh, oh, many. Actually, I heard about, I heard that you had, it was your dissertation that started the adult, adult attachment interview, That's which correct. probably most of our listeners are more familiar with. Uh, Patricia Crittenden, I was doing an um, interview with her and she was really uh, great about pointing that out and I didn't know that, so that's exciting. So as you're talking about assessment, you know, this is, I can't think of anybody who would know more right now um, about accuracy in assessment attachment and assessing attachment um, in children and kind of the overview of what uh, the state of the field looks like right now around um, being able to understand attachment and use it in real life. Yeah, yeah, use it in the clinic. So, um, and before we get into those details, can you just say a little bit about how um, how you ended up here? Like where you started from, what were your early interests? Uh, because this is an amazing spot to land. And again, I feel so privileged to be sitting with you, uh, but I wonder about your, your journey here. Yes, thank you. Well, I think a lot of us are land ultimately in places where we didn't begin. So I actually began in it with a passion in marine biology, uh, which was a great segue to attachment theory. Um, I'll, I'll skip ahead just a second because my interest was in biology. Uh, and when I came to Berkeley to, to do my doctorate in 1980, no, excuse me, that was the dissertation, uh, 1974. Um, uh, it was going to either be biological psychology or developmental psychology. So then the question arises, well, why am I not a marine biologist? And uh, sadly, I cannot dive. I can't, I can't scuba. I can skin dive, but I can't scuba dive. Um, 
it, it's scary and I'm claustrophobic and my career as a marine biologist was over. <laughs> so um, at some point I thought perhaps pediatrics, but uh, medical school didn't appeal to me. I didn't have that right kind of intervention and understanding that I was looking for. So I came to UC Berkeley to study developmental psychologists. Um, took a lot of courses in biological psychology thinking maybe I would um, uh, go over into that group at some point and became quite a, an expert at the time on fruit flies, which is what people were studying genetically then. Um, but when my former advisor, Dr. Mary Main, arrived at Berkeley, which was the second quarter of my graduate year, first graduate year, um, I knew that attachment theory was where I would land. And I went in in 1974 and never left, basically, because what of was the biology. Like Yes, the biology and, and, you know, with the last couple of decades of the neuroscience and the relational neuro, neurobiology, you all were ahead of yourselves from that perspective. In many ways we were, but we didn't have the, the um, equipment and we didn't have the models. I mean, my work in neurobiology now is uh, primarily with Dr. Anna Buchheim, who was at the University of Innsbruck. Um, in part because she, and they also work at front of the University of Ulm in Germany. Um, so they have, of course, as a large university and Ulm is a medical university, um, all of the equipment. So I had the theory and I had mm -hmm. the knowledge and the desire and Anna, who's a, a great colleague and friend, um, had all of the, all the rest. And so mm -hmm. the work that I do now, that is, you know, literally hard science is, uh, the work that I do at Anna, but that's how I got um, to where to, to Berkeley. And then may, um, may I ask you just yes. real briefly, what was it like meeting Mary Main? Well, I met Mary Main through a an assigned pro seminar, so it it wasn't exactly like the students could say, "Oh, hello," you know, I'm right. so and so. And she actually didn't come until the second quarter. Um, her position was supposed to start in the fall. Uh, she did not start in the fall with our entering class. She, she started in the winter, so it would be 1975, actually, when I was uh, introduced to attachment theory. And uh, nobody knew her or of her. She had, uh, you know, and we have a new professor in the department, and you have to take this class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how it was, like, uh -huh. like many of my students. Uh, you you, um, you want to take this class? Here's your professor. Sign up boom, there you are, you introduce yourself on the first day and you go from there. Uh, Mary, Mary was young, uh, she's 10 years older than I am and I was 21 when I started my doctoral studies. So she was 31, 32 when she came to, to uh, UC Berkeley. So there, there was a lot of youth, a lot of um, excitement. She had just finished her own dissertation and of course had worked directly with Mary Ainsworth and, had a lot of uh, lot to offer us and also a lot of work for us to do. Uh, we, we were lucky over the course of the time that we worked with Mary, those of us who stayed with attachment, um, to be able to work with some of Mary Ainsworth's original observational data because mm -hmm. Mary Ainsworth generously gave, uh, I don't know who else she gave that to, but I know Mary had copies of those. Uh, original naturalistic observations. And um, I remember the first project we did was on baby anger. Um, so there was a lot of, there was just a lot of, um, I wanna say rich interaction because we actually had uh, contact through Mary with the work that Mary Ainsworth had done. So that, is that was exciting. And yes, that's part of why I wanted to kind of capture the history a little bit um, of this lineage, it's amazing. So Berkeley was my life. Um, I, I know that it was not recommended that I spend 10 years in graduate school, but I spent 10 years in graduate school. I actually had two dissertations. Uh, the first topic was not, uh, the first topic was built on my master's thesis, which was one of the first child abuse studies in the field of attachment. And um, we, boy, we got two publications out of that and it was very rich again, using the observational method that Mary Main had brought with her from Mary Ainsworth's lab. And um, I was supposed to work in Los Angeles with um, uh, Dr. James Kemp, who was famous for actually the wild child, the 13-year-old the that was discovered 
who had been basically confined to her room for 13 years. Um, and he was part of a group at Children's Hospital there in LA that was working in child maltreatment. And somehow or another, I had this, I had proposed, you know, I was past my proposal. Uh, that's how we got the second publication was actually out of the uh, dis dissertation defense. And uh, Children's Hospital fired them, psychiatry. Wow. I was going to figure out how to commute back and forth to LA. I had a small baby at the time, uh, which was another reason why it took me so long to get through graduate school. But um, that was the end of that dissertation. At least we got a publication off of it. <laughs> and then another baby. Um, I, I remember being pregnant and having my second child transcribing all of the original adult attachment interviews um, that Mary May still uses for, for training mm -hmm. on a IBM right. Selectric typewriter. There were no such thing as computers then. Oh my gosh, <laughs> how tedious. How tedious, but there's something about, um, and you probably know this because you work with recording. There's something about working with recording and then turning it into a transcription that really slows the mind down and you get a good sense of what somebody is actually saying. Mm. So that, that was just all part of our, our training in that lab. We did everything. We videoed, we, we um, transcribed, we designed studies. Um, my study was part of Mary Main's social development project where she brought children in that she had seen as infants. And I had seen them too, because I was there for a long time. <laughs> um, and then they were coming back at kindergarten age. And that's when we designed the whole project that became the adult attachment interview. Uh, Nancy Kaplan got, did her drawing assessment through that. And the Maine and Cassidy age five um, strain situation format and classification system came out of that project. It was a big, big project. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah I was going to try to also put it in context around from with the strange situation. Um, would you mind just kind of for people who aren't familiar, like just very briefly, the strange situation measures what and then the AI measures what? Okay, well, the strange situation, no matter what age you're doing it, um, because that now there are, I'll just mention, now there are ways to use the strain situation all the way from about 11 and a half months to seven, I think, is the older age that people are using it with. Um, is, it the same, is it the same protocol or is it? It's pretty much the same procedure. You, you, uh, it, you don't leave the baby alone very, uh, without the, the parent for very long because they're babies, right? Right. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the misunderstandings about the strain situation is, you know, they're, they're three minute episodes and several of those episodes are the baby with a stranger or the baby left alone in the room and people think, well, I have to leave the baby for three months, three minutes with a stranger and the baby's screaming and that's not the case. So um, the strain situation, especially with the infants, uh, is massaged around the capability of the baby to tolerate a stranger and to tolerate the separation. Now, why that's important is that uh, Mary Ainsworth, through her work, had discovered that um, the whole, whole series of episodes of the strain situation were important. There is a flow, and I know we're going to attachment disorganization later, but part of attachment disorganization um, was discovered by looking at how the flow of these episodes went in the strain situation. But what was discovered was that the, the piece de resistance of the strain situation, which is true for babies, and I think it's true for all of us, is when you have a separation. And Bowlby had spoke at length and wrote a whole volume on separation about how separation uh, signifies a potential threat to the relationship and is what he calls a, a natural situation that should be very scary to, for everybody until you become used to the conditions and daycare, for example, for little ones. So the separation is an important, let's say, stimulus activator. I like to use the word activator of the attachment system. But the question then is what happens when the parent comes back? What happens on the reunion? And what should be happening is some kind of reweaving of this relationship. Uh, and so that's why the strain, strain situation has been so successful. And it's about patterns. It's not whether the baby cries or not during the separation. It's not 
how close the baby gets to the door before the parent comes back in the room that the parent will call the baby's name out before um, the parent enters. But it's about the patterning and that's what is so rich about attachment and Mary Ainsworth's original contributions. And of course, working with John Bowley who looked at patterns in all of his books. So that's the basis with infants. And then as children get older- and Do you mind if I- Sure. Um, and so it's measuring um, not the, not the bait it's measuring the actual the relationship like how they go not it's not um, a diagnosis for a baby correct when we do attachment assessment through behavioral observation we're always measuring the relationship and the relationship is the intersection of these two people right here um it, it's the dance they quote unquote dan stern's um uh, language, uh, the, the notion of dance that they do together. Of course, over time, that becomes internalized and becomes part of the, the self. That's right. Um, and the, part of why I was really wanting to, um, you know, there's a real movement to get away from, you know, disorder and things like that, and sort of thinking of it in terms of strategy and adaptation based on environment. So exactly. Um, is that, is that, Exactly. And yeah. adaptation. And uh, Alan Shroff has, because I'm an old person, I can remember all when all these papers came out, but Alan Shroff uh, and Everett Waters wrote beautiful papers. And then with his wife, June Shroff, about attachment as an organizational behavioral system, not just a set of behaviors that you count. And I think it's important historically to think about when the uh, attachment was coming in in the 1970s, behaviorism was still the main movement of thinking about um, behavior and thinking about even development in, in our country. Uh, and of course, psychoanalysis was still very prevalent in Europe. Um, and if people would do strange situations, for example, and they would put um, 12 inch tiles down on the floor and would actually count how many inches and feet a baby would go, you know, to get to the parent from more of a behaviorist perspective, or there would be some discussion about, well, the baby didn't cry. But what we know now, and we didn't know then, and we had to have these discussions. And if anyone is interested in history, there are some fabulous published conversations between um, Gewurz and Ainsworth. And Gewurz was the person who was the main, um, was the behaviorist spokesperson about infant crying and all kinds of back and forth, just oh, fabulous. Know. Yeah, I know that people will be interested in that. So we will link that to the show notes. I'll get that from you. Yeah. Um, so so what, what we've learned over time is that what Mary Ainsworth proposed and which uh, from using John Bowlby's work about the idea that it's, you know, from biology, that it's not one behavior, that it's an organization of behaviors and vocalizations and facial expressions that accomplish an evolutionary goal, which is ultimately the protection of the baby. And the baby has to get close to the parent to do that. So it's the, the proximate goal is proximity and physical proximity for babies. So as we know, developmentally, 12 month olds, kind of just moving through the ages, um, 12 month olds, and three month, three year olds are really not that different. <laughs> we, we'd like to think so as parents, but no, they're not really that different. Um, and in fact, uh, as Bowlby showed, and then we have learned since, the three-year-olds are as sensitive to the strain situation as babies because really? three, three-year-olds development now allows them to understand more fears and, and you know, how situations work. So I, I know there's a preschool uh, system, and I'm telling you now, there's a preschool system that is an adaptation of the strain situation for these older children, threes, fours, uh, and, and fives, um, that uh, some people do those strain situations the same way as you would with a baby, same length of time as separated, which is three months, three, excuse me, minutes for an infant. And other people elongate the time that the baby is separated from the parent a little bit. Because the idea is you do need to see attachment action, so to speak. Yeah, you need a little threat. Yeah, and, and yeah. but the, 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 uh, the stranger and the, the reunion, the parent coming in is pretty much all the same. Um, historically, Jude Casty and Mary Main created that six-year system before the preschool group got started. We, we kind of, we, we didn't go linearly in this field of development. We had babies 
And then we had six-year-olds and adults. And then we went backwards and did the preschool system uh, through the MacArthur group. And, and middle childhood is still, still a little dicey, but we can talk about middle childhood in a second. So what happens as the children move towards six, five and six, is that uh, they have longer separations. They only have one separation. You look at one reunion, but it's still the same basic idea. What is the pattern of rebuilding this relationship under a situation of normative stress? And, and I want to say normative, even though a second separation for many babies or even a first separation is really upsetting. It's normative because um, it fit in part with uh, Mary Ainsworth's observations of children in the home, which she developed originally from her observations of babies and their mothers in Uganda. So the, the, the idea for the strange situation didn't start in Baltimore, it started in Africa. Um, and so the if you overstress a baby, we now know that you can dysregulate them. If you overstress anybody, you can dysregulate them. So with, with strain situation, we're trying to get a more typical snapshot of how this relationship works. Now for clinicians, I just wanted to put in a blurb here about clinicians. Uh, clinicians are not always in a position to, to do what we do in our research. And so what many clinicians have done is um, kind of set aside the idea of getting an idea about classification, where did this baby fit within the, the rubric of, of uh, attachment, but rather some clinicians set up many separation reunion situations with their child clients uh, in their offices so that they can still get a snapshot it's different than the strain situation. We wouldn't want to use it for research, but from a clinical perspective, you can begin to get a snapshot of how this relationship manages uh, a stressful situation and how did the baby and the parent come back together again. This is so important what you're saying because um, clinicians are always interested in being as um, you know informed and everything and be able to use it use the data from the research in their sessions and in, you know, I know parents are listening and in real life. Exactly. So would you, since, since you say that, like, can you just do a quick outline of like what that looks like for the, to use it clinically, not um, for research? Okay. And before I give an outline, I want to, I want everybody to understand, we have to be very careful that we're not making a, a formal assessment of yeah. the child's attachment. We're yeah, looking. You said it was patterns. We're looking, but we're also not saying this is a secure child. This is an insecure child. That's right. We're saying this is what we see when the parent, mother or father comes together after a separation. So, so you would set up basically, um, you're, you know, you'd have, you'd have your, your playroom. People who work with young children usually have a playroom somewhere with lots of fun toys. And, and uh, you are the stranger. At, often as as the clinician um, and send the parent out and if it's a young child try for three minutes uh, have the parent call the child's name outside the door make sure there's a door so that you can close the door uh, and I'm talking about using this method in more of an industrialized society where you have rooms and doors but you can do that in other societies as well without rooms and doors um, and send the parent out, you know, three minutes or five minutes if you have an older child. The, the problem with the, the older, older children, five, six, and seven, is that when we're using the uh, method, those separations last about an hour because those children are pretty sturdy. So I think it'd be best to recommend that this would be something one, a clinician would do with a young child not a child who's moved into kindergarten age or the five to seven ship. And, and then watch what happens when they come back. Um, another thing that, that people do clinically uh, is they add to the strain situation. And Judith and I did that in, in one of our studies of babies. We we're talking about divorce and custody value, uh, custody overnight and non-overnight custody, is they'll have uh, the parent and the child engage in a cleanup situation. 
where you have all these nice toys and the baby's been playing, now it's time to clean them up. And it's great to add that to the strain situation clinically or some kind of modified strain situation clinically, in my opinion, because a cleanup situation is not about the, re the coming together of the relationship. The cleanup situation says, parent, can you take charge when you need to take charge? And so you get a nice balance between how you come together and then how, how you take charge or don't. Oh, this, that, uh, that is fascinating. And I know there's parents all over the world listening, probably terrified of this conversation. <laughs> so, so I wanna be reassuring that again, this isn't diagnostic. Uh, it gives us a feel, but what I like about an, us pulling this out so that it's more accessible for folks is that it helps give them a direction of where to go. So even what you just said was, uh, it's measuring to see if the parent can manage, um, can have authority when they need to. And, yeah, and, and, also, and, and is the child want, you know, does the child come to them afterwards, the reunion? Yeah, and so you want to do the you want to do the take charge after this reunion. And, and I, have a, I have a message to all of you parents out there. I had two children while I was studying in this lab for 10 years and we didn't know much. And in fact, when I first started in the lab, there was no disorganized attachment. There was only an, what we call an avoidant attachment, which was um, a, a child who uh, looked more independent, but did than other children, but, and, didn't, uh, and didn't really reconnect with a parent right away. It's not a sign of bad parenting. It, it was not, it's just, this is how the parent, the child managed the arousal of being left alone or being distressed and not having direct access to the parent. And my story and my message to you, you parents is uh, attachment can really interfere with your relationship with your baby. <laughs> You mean learning about it? Yeah, well, and every time your child looks away from you, don't assume that your child is insecure. That is not the case. <laughs> you don't know anything about, I mean, you know, ch children, sometimes you go to pick them up at their childcare facility and they run away from you. Oh my God, my child hates you. That is, this is not an assessment situation. This is, I've had a great day, mom or dad, and you are too early and I'm not ready to go home. But then that's a place where, of course, we have to gently take charge. But my message is don't overanalyze your own children. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you, you really are interested in that, uh, those patterns and where you are uh, to find a, a good, well-informed clinical psychologist who, uh, you know, who knows how to help understand patterns. And then I do have also a message to the professional group who listens to these podcasts, which are, um, there are trainings available in all of the attachment measures that we'll talk about here today and others that we won't get to. Uh, for example, Dr. Judith Solomon, um, and, and, and these measures are, these trainings are done on the internet now, which means you don't have to pack a suitcase and travel, which is lovely. Uh, and so Dr. Judith Solomon runs a strain situation training. There's usually a training coming out of the University of Minnesota. Uh, and so um, please, professionals out there, please entertain the idea if you, you really want to understand how this works, even if you can't do a strain situation in your practice, okay, the whole 21 minute session. These trainings are fabulous seminars for understanding what it means to have these patterns and ideas about where to, especially in infant mental health, where to, to kind of focus your first attempts at intervention. Yeah, I totally second that. And that, that's part of like pulling out the research and being able to use it clinically even these ideas um, and the projective of uh, like failed mourning and um, preoccupied suffering, uh, even just really understanding what some of the big concepts are that you're finding um, really can help us tune in and intervene in more, you know, more detailed, accurate ways. Yeah, it, it changes how you look at things. Uh, it, even a, a short seminar can help yep. broaden your lens. And we're not trying to change anybody and we're not trying to change the, our, our professionals either, but we're trying to give more of a lens. More information. Um, I, I do a webinar uh, called, What Does It All Mean? Which is like a six hour, <laughs> here we are, um, that uh, precedes the trainings that I do because so many people are not getting 
much about attachment, maybe a day in their graduate programs, if that. Uh, maybe they read a blurb in a developmental psychology book as an undergraduate, maybe that's all they have. So um, I, I do this really intensive training that we do it over a course of one day because it's leading into another training, but sometimes I've spread it over a series of days. Um, they're, they're cheap relative to you know what you get. They're very inexpensive. And um, one can just find out when these are going to happen by going to the website for the adult attachment projective. Which is, go ahead and say what that is. Uh, I'd say just look up adult attachment projective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on your and this will be search engine. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And uh, the, there is a, um, a everything that we offer, but also a schedule of what the different trainings are. Mm -hmm. That's um, a great resource just in general. It's got some articles it's just, and yeah, it's really yeah, good. Yeah. So I think that I distracted us a little bit that we were, um, I hadn't asked about the strange situation just to put in context what then the adult attachment interview and then, you know, where you ended up going with it with the projective. Um, okay. All answer. right. Yeah. So the. So I think yeah. The AI the, or, or the, it, sorry. Let, let me go chrono more chronologically, even though we didn't do that. Um, developmentally, because that might make more sense to folks. Developmentally, uh, behavior is still always. In fact, Mary Ainsworth were just lamented the fact that we've stopped looking at behavior. Oh, there's one other measure that I want to put out there though, uh, is called the attachment Q sort. And that Q sort is being used by professionals and researchers. Um, it was developed by Everett Waters and his colleague. And um, if you look up online, johnbolby.com, that will take you to Everett Waters uh, website. And he actually has the Q sort on the website. And you can use that from infancy to around age five. And that measure is less about, it's not about separation reunion per se, that measure is about the question of how does the child use the, par use the parent uh, in the situation because you watch the child in different situations. So it's truly observationally based, different contexts. How does the child navigate between using the parent as a haven of safety when they need contact, not always picked up, but when they need contact and closeness, balanced by how do, how do they explore the environment? How do they go out in the world? I like to say, how does the baby take the world apart? And so it's a slightly different view of attachment. It's always looking at the balance of what we call the attachment system and the exploratory system. And many people who uh, are in a position where they can do multiple observations because you have to have a lot more observations or if we are um, uh, going cross-culturally and observing elsewhere, um, you are using the Q-sort and it's a lovely measure. Okay, so what happens when, when we become older is our behavior uh, is still a fabulous demonstration of, of who we are but it's harder to see. We get better, young children get better at understanding, kind of this metacognitive self-monitoring that goes place. Uh, it's also the case developmentally that what starts out as behavior uh, becomes represented mentally. So we talk about these mental representations. The buzzword in attachment following on John Bowlby is called the internal working model. But basically what he was doing was reworking the psychoanalytic idea of mental representation. And that idea was being uh, researched and explored and elaborated on simultaneously by cognitive psychologists who were not interested in attachment or biology at all. <laughs> okay. So we have these these wonderful coming together of different theoretical perspectives. And these begin, hmm, they begin about four, but we can use representation solidly, four and a half is pushing it, but five for the rest of our lives. That's what these other measures are. But for children, there are uh, representational measures. I know Judith and I have a doll play yeah, and there's nice. several other doll plays out there. Uh, and of course, people are welcome to contact you who can contact me directly for 
uh, Judith and I have written a uh, chapter in the Handbook of Attachment on methods of assessing attachment in children. So that middle group, latency age, as we call from the psychoanalyst, um, people are pretty much using representational measures. They're faster, they're cheaper, you need a set of dolls. There's just, they're easy, they're fun. And I think they're delightful. So while we were at Berkeley and the five-year-old, five, six-year-old strain situation was just something that uh, we kind of came up with because the kids were coming back, ha having been seen as babies. Um, Nancy Kaplan and Mary Main and I created the adult attachment interview, which became part of the foundation. Well, it was part, yeah, very much part of the foundation of my dissertation. Uh, the first publication was in 1984 uh, in my dissertation. And the questions in the adult attachment interview, um, Mary, Mary Main describes it as shocking the unconscious. We, there, are, there are interviews out there and, and we have to use them. As clinicians, we have to use them to get some idea about what the events are and um, it kind, of, kind of what were the scripts around certain kinds of activities that you do in the home, like what was mealtime like perhaps, or uh, when we're talking with parents about their children, what is bedtime like, what happens when you try to clean up at home. But that's not what the AAI is. The AAI changed course uh, and asked, and asks an individual to describe the event that is associated with a descriptor. So, and we would start out, for example, and this is a really hard question, to choose five words, five descriptive words to describe your relationship, not your parent, not you, but we want to get that, that intersection, your relationship with your parent as a child growing up and try to go back as early as you can remember. It's interesting that people often remember around age 10, but a lot of people remember earlier than that. And then lead through the pros, lead the individual to describe the actual events. And so we do that for mother, we do that for father, we, we ask about if there were other um, attachment figures in the home, because many families might have had an aunt or a grandparent, or a nanny who they really felt was, you know, this really wasn't my mother, the nanny was my mother. And then we marched through, literally marched through Bowlby's volumes, and the lost volume was um, being sent to us in pieces, <laughs> mailed across the, and there was no email, there was no fax. Um, yeah, welcome to the world of the 1970s and 80s, early 80s. There, none of this technology. And so Mary would receive copies of these chapters of loss, given them to Nancy and I to read. Um, the point being, though, that then we started to ask questions about attachment events. Tell us about separation. Tell us you ever, if you ever felt rejected by your parents. Tell us what happened. Uh, tell me what happened when you were sick. And finally, the interview ends with, have you ever experienced a loss? And then in 1995, uh, Mary and I got together and we uh, added another question to the interview based on my experience with parents, which was, have, is there anything that you have experienced that you think is a trauma? And so it's a long interview. Um, uh, it. it uh, I, I think it has a place as an intake interview, actually. You really got a lot of information about a person's life without asking them about the specific events of those lives, except for the attachment events. Um, and so that now, I, I think we all agree, is the gold standard. Mary and, and Ruth Goldwyn and then Eric Hesse became involved, her husband. Um, the AI is all over the world. It's been translated into many lang languages. Um, in the meantime, though, Judith Solomon, Solomon and I uh, were more interested in bringing in another part of um, attachment, which the field had ignored, which is called the caregiving behavioral system. And it's what the parent brings to the strain situation, right? Is what the, the parent brings to the AAI uh, is his or her or their own attachment system. But there is a representation of caregiving system. So Judith and I have done 
tremendous amount of work. And kind of left, we graduated, um, we were working together doing observations in families' homes as part of a project that was trying to help children. Uh, it was an intervention project with middle-class families to be pro-social. So that was a whole different orientation. But we were able through that funding to do some home observations of kindergarten age children with their mothers primarily. The, fa the fathers tended not to be home when we were there. Um, that's a whole other conversation. But um, so the caregiving system pr pretty much took over my work and Judith and I have been now colleagues for 46 years. So we've had quite a path. Uh, but we've done a lot with the caregiving system and the caregiving interview and um, looking at caregiving behavior when children are doing our doll play session and some other interactions. That was happening. And then also Mac West uh, in Canada, he was working in Calgary, Canada, because of my experience with the AAI, invited me onto a project that he was working on. And independently, Mac had created with his colleagues in, in Canada uh, some questionnaires about attachment. Uh, they're still used today. One is the reciprocal attachment questionnaire. And then when he started to work with me, he developed an adolescent uh, attachment questionnaire, the AQ, all these, these um, abbreviations, right? And also developed one for um, dysregulation and which I've used in my lab, I put them both together. But the piece that was important here is that Mac reached out to me because of my background in the AEI and he'd already started to, to work on a picture system for what became the adult attachment projected picture system. And the reason he reached out to me is he said that he and his colleagues were really successful in uh, using these pictures uh, to differentiate secure versus insecure representations in adults, but they could not get into the, the heart of insecurity. They, they just could not flesh it out. Um, and Mac, uh, who, if, if he had lived, he's, he's gone now, but uh, he would be approaching 80. So in his training, he was pretty psychodynamically trained very psychodynamic. So he knew the TAT, he knew the Rorschach, he knew a lot of the projectives, which is how the, the term projective got put into the title. And um, did some backup studies to figure out what types of images, very, very much like the history of the TAT, except for he used drawings rather than the TAT used photographs that he got in magazines even. And uh, with undergraduate students, they asked his colleagues before I came on, asked people, you know, how different questions about how these pictures arouse them, so to speak. And he had settled on a set of six pictures. And then Dan Benoit in Montreal suggested that we needed some, he needed something for maltreatment. So I was coming into that, which is our last picture. I, I was coming into that situation with something already moving forward but they were stuck. And he, he invited me up. We met many, 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 many times. And he'd come to California, but mostly I would go to Canada. And the piece I think that is so important about the AAP, Adults Attachable Projective Picture System, is that Mac did not have a background in attachment. And I had seen attachment across the lifespan from baby to middle childhood to adult through the AAI and the caregiving interview. So I'd seen that piece and the doll play and I already developed this representational measure with Judith Solomon. And what we see in the AAP is um, a synergy. Mm of these different approaches. There, there is very little of the AI actually in the AP. He had some piece of it to uh, measure coherence, which people measure with the AI. But it turns out that coherence when you are using a representational measure is not the question on the table. And that's true for children's doll play too. It's, it's really not about how coherent they are. So it this is, idea of a coherent narrative. Exactly. Right. I mean, for secures, yeah. But 
it doesn't really help you flesh out the patterns and the nuances either of security or of the different ideas that are part of insecurity. Do you mind, do you mind if I just take half a step back just for a second so that you're sure. not too lost in the, because I'm fascinated and I know there are people that are just like hanging on your every word. Well, but we got a but, lot of trees, but no forest. <laughs> well, well, but, but um, there'll be people that don't quite. So sometimes it, like, so here's what I'm hearing is it starts out behavioral and that we're right the strange situation then it moves into representation exactly um and that i my understanding is that part of um how and again this old matter um related to self-report and things like that but that the ai the magic of the ai is it's not so much what you're saying but how you're saying it if that's yeah. right yeah and, and so whether you're, you're saying it yeah yeah how you're saying it me like narrative patterns um, because that it's getting, it's beginning to get at the unconscious. So it's not just self-report. Ex exactly. Right? Exactly. Right. And, and it, then your projective test even goes further with that. Um, and then go ahead and pick up, but I just want well, to I make was sure that say people were following. The, the projective. So as we know, in an interview, even if you are with your beloved, you know, uh, psychotherapist, uh, and this has been demonstrated empirically, um, that we can choose what we want to talk about. We, we can choose. And a lot of people with the AAI um, do choose. But the power of the AAI is how you choose it and how you say it. But there's still, especially when it comes to trauma, there's a lot of material that we've now discovered that people don't talk about. Either because they don't want to talk about it or the questions in the AAI don't quite get to it. Um, and so, the projective, whether you're using it with children or the AAP, is even more directed towards, um, it's not directed towards discourse. It's not directed towards the language part of our brain. It really creeps into the limbic system. It really shows more of the emotional self. And so you get, a, you get a really good picture still of the balance between how people say it, how people tell the story. But it's not so much about whether they can tell a coherent narrative, which is very much a part of the discourse that you have in an interview. Um, it's also part of self-reflective functioning. Some people use the AAI, a couple of questions off the AAI to assess self-reflective functioning like Peter Fonagy and others. Um, we have discovered the people who are using the AAP today um, that this measure just unlocks the unconscious in a way that we, we never anticipated. The original goal when Mac brought me on was to see if the AAP could match what the AAI was doing in a more direct, more economical way. It, it was very pragmatic what he was trying to do. And what we discovered was yes, the pragmatics of the AAP and the AAI are well established both in my research and then uh, Anna Buchheim has a huge number of studies. Uh, so in different languages, uh, it's been established in, in Italy as well. Um, lots of studies to that regard. But what we've discovered as we went farther with the development of the AAP that we'll talk about a little bit later is, is that there are kinds there are ways in which trauma is revealed in the AP. You don't know what the event is. So you have, if you really want to explore that, you have to explore it with your cop, your client directly. Okay, or maybe well, and, and a lot of times the client might not exactly know what the event is, but there's still trauma yeah. stored in their body. Exactly. And, yeah. And so the, so instead of forcing them, to, you know, were you abused or not abused? It's you're reading from their responses. Um, implicit memories and unconscious and the right exactly. and the limbic uh, that the you know the body doesn't lie it's basically uh, you're pulling that story out which is so beautiful and I know so many people uh, we have a lot of somatic therapists and things like that yeah. that really understand this and the importance yeah. of this so this is super exciting well I, one of the things that a lot of people are using now and even the attachment people have uh, moved into their work is the aces um, adverse childhood experiences, but it's still, did this happen to you? Yes, no. Um, uh, in the last study that I did, we, we had, we didn't use the ACES, but we had some other large paper and pencil um, questionnaire, which 
I, I'm not a fan of, of questionnaires, but we, ha we had this, we developed it with some of my graduate students over the years and I used it in my study. Uh, and it, it wasn't just did this happen to you, yes or no, but it also tapped into uh, Judith Solomon found in our work that, and, and I did in my dissertation, which is why the way I used the AI originally didn't work. Did you experience a loss or not? Yes or no? Doesn't mean anything. Right. But what we had them do in this other questionnaire was uh, report in, on a little rating scale, one to five, how distressed you were, how, how vulnerable you felt, how, whether you felt protected or not. But even that, um, I can see very clearly in my sample that defensive processes kicked in and yes, this event happened to me or no, it didn't, but yes, it happened to me. Nah, it didn't bother me very much. It's fine, it's fine. So um, that this is something that the AAP I think this is where the AP has its place in attachment assessment. Um, our Judith Solomon's and my doll play has a place in attachment assessment as compared to all of the other doll play assessments that are out there as well, because we do not choose, we're the only method that does not choose the family of dolls for the child. We don't choose the race, we don't choose the gender, we don't choose whether the child doll is, the self doll is a child or an adult, we let the child choose the whole thing. And we've discovered that like with the AAP, but at the level of children, there are nuances. They're very interesting when a five-year-old child chooses an adult woman doll to be the self. There's something going on there because children don't. There's something going on that the child would never be able to explain. Exactly. or even yeah even organize in any way so that's that's really exciting yeah you know the other thing you had said about the AP um is that even with the AI you're still talking about yourself and um and kind of what happened to you whereas with the AP it's even more removed which is part of why it gets at the unconscious so powerfully like you're just talking about the picture is what you exactly. think is what you th yeah so for those of you who, who are not familiar with the AP, what we're talking about here is that there are a set of pictures. They are ambiguous, they're drawn. So you're not gonna get a beautiful picture like my background here. You're gonna get very, um, very ambiguous settings. Uh, and, and there are people in them, they're black and white drawings, very simple. And, um, and, and in fact, because you and I earlier and in, in, in my work right now, a lot of the questions that come up are about culture. And I was just told by a colleague of mine who was presenting the AP to some interns, um, a very multicultural group. And there was a question about culture. And one of the African-American uh, interns said, well, um, I don't know about you, but when I look at these pictures, I see Black people. Mm. <laughs> and Project she said, yeah, there you go. And, and yes, it's great. When you what if, you know, name, I won't name names, uh, look at these pictures, you probably see white people. Mm -hmm. So they're that ambiguous. And the piece that you were uh, pointing out, Sue, is that the story is about a hypothetical person. It's not about you. And it's the you that it may be too painful to talk about in the AP. Mm, or AI, powerful. but the hypothetical person can who you, is can not you. Can you say that again? Can you say that again? That was so powerful. So I hope so. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you're telling a story about a hypothetical person. It is not about you. You don't have to cover up your own pain. And if you don't know that you're in pain, it'll come out in the AP. Now, some people do tell their own story, but that's not what you're being asked to do. So it's a whole different neuro set of neurophysiological processes. It's still about attachment, mm -hmm. but the instructions are so different that we are trying to understand who the self is through the hypothetical. It, the projectives, this kind of not an accepted term sometimes now in many uh, areas, but they are uh, free response measures. Uh, they allow you to be creative. And some people are really creative and they, they don't they think they'll put something on us? You know, <laughs> I'm going to put something over on you and tell you the story of Batman <laughs> in response to this stimulus. Well, okay, <laughs> tell us about Batman. One of the things that I have found that is so powerful about this is when you look at the pictures. So I'm thinking there was one example, one of the child in the corner, 
Yeah, and, that's, that's the heaviest one. Right. And uh, basically it's a line drawing and it's just hinted at that it's a corner, but you can kind of see there's lines on the floor. It's yeah. a corner. Um, some people miss that, <laughs> uh, but uh, you, and the child has their hands in front of them. Um, they kind of, he's kind of in, let's see, he's kind of like in this position and there's a yes. corner. It's like, that's right. So, hmm. right. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the variety of responses, like when you look at it, you, any of us, you know, person, what you see, you think everybody sees. It just right. seems like, oh, well, obviously this little boy is X, whatever it is, uh, is warding off the mother throwing the shoe at them or whatever. Uh, right where somebody else sees it and says, you know, oh, mom's trying to give him broccoli and he doesn't want the broccoli or, right. and, and it feels like to the person telling the story that that's what everybody would see, but this is the power of it. Is it like, oh no, that's not true at all. <laughs> and that the story that we make up is, is that that's what we're getting at is that that's where the juice is. And then we can begin to put piece things together from there. Well, you know, you just, uh, you just created what would be a really interesting study. Oh, which would be, what do you see? And then what do you think everybody else sees? So oh, interesting. But that would be, you know, that would not be for assessment. Uh, it, sometimes the boy is in a box practicing uh, being a mime. Um, sometimes the, I, the, I'm thinking about the, uh, the more extreme ones that I've seen that are just so, uh, so surprising. I mean, uh, I won't so, say so the, the one that's really disturbing, but the, some of them are, uh, I've had a few that are in a glass elevator. Mm. So when there, when there's something like, like the mine um, to, to, to begin to get in, what you're, you're actually looking for very specific things and they, it gets marked as whether it being um, not, I don't know the language where you're dismissing information, you're avoiding information, emotional right. information, or you might be amplifying it, uh, emotional information. Is that right? That's correct. And, and did you want to go through a little bit about the AAP, uh, how you analyze them now, or did you want to stay with more general? What, what would you like to do? Well, I'm, all, I'm also just a little bit aware of time, but um, I actually think that people would be really interested in just a couple of specific sure. examples so that sure. they, you know, like these are the, what to take out of the research, these exactly. ideas. Great. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. That'd be great. So um, you use the, all of the story. There's a warm up story. And then my colleague in England who works with intellectually disabled adults uh, added a couple more warm ups because it's not about a, it's not a, an achievement task. And they, and they needed to get, uh, you, you use as many warm ups as you need to get a person settled and starting to tell stories. You know, people say, well, I'm not a very good storyteller. Well, we don't really care. Uh, but typically, just one quick warm up, warm up. The warm up that we use is two children uh, playing ball. It, it, almost everybody in the world has seen it that way. Uh, there are four pictures of individuals who don't have any other people portrayed in the scene, like corner, for example. There are, so they're called the alone stimuli. And biologists, and this was brought forward also by John Bowlby, say that the most, the scariest, most threatening experience that we can have is to be alone. We are not meant, we are social animals. We are not meant to be alone and isolated. So there are four stimuli that portray aloneness. There are three stimuli that portray an individual with a potential other attachment figure. And uh, one is an adult couple dyad, and the other involved a child and an adult. And for those of you who are listening, uh, the, these pictures, fortunately or unfortunately, are on the internet. You, you can see them. You can take a look at them. So I won't describe them in great detail. But you, you code each picture separately. And in the alone pictures, we want to know. Uh, we want it was so we could do we look at content and we look at defensive processes for all of these uh, responses and for the alone pictures we want to know something about what we call agency of self can because these are distressing pictures and Anna Buchheim has demonstrated this at the neurophysiological level in fact she has demonstrated that the order of presentation which is mixed up lone and dyadic pictures 
actually in, in community samples, the last picture of this corner picture that you refer to is the greatest activator in people, if at, you know, in their brains. So we want to know about agency and of self, what is the person, how is the person addressing this stress? They don't have to tell a story about stress, but we know that stress is there and we assume so based on the strain situation research, but we now know based on honest research. And the, 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 most, uh, the most productive type of response that people can have are responses that try to, to describe uh, and we interpret as reestablishing homeostasis in response to this distress. Other forms of agency might be that the character does something. You know, character is distressed, he goes to the cafe and gets a cup of coffee. That's doing something rather than not doing anything at all. So we're looking at agency and we are looking also in the alone stimuli. What is the, the individual story tell us about their desire to be connected to other people? It's kind of, kind of Roshaki in a way I'm understanding now, but we didn't know that at the time. We call it connectedness. And according to our biology, the, the best connections we can make when we're under stress are with our attachment figure, with a friend, or even with our sexual partner. And so we read the story and we say, well, are there other people in the story and who are they? Maybe the connection is with a teacher. Well, that's great, you're connected, but that's not what your biology, biology was built to do, but a teacher is better than nobody. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. I'm just saying, what is your biology wanting here? And there are other people who are not ever connected. They just remain alone. Right, and related what you're saying about the teacher is that this, the, the person who's looking at the picture can make up anything. Exactly. It can be make up anything so that they, their mind would fall on a teacher is informative rather than their parent rather than that, their parent it, that's interesting because yeah. all of these scenes were chosen based on theory to be activators strong activators of the attachment system so that we would choose a professional even our psychologist rather than our parent if we are the projective self of a child means that we have a relationship with this professional, but it is a diversion of our biology. And what we're trying to do in our clinical work is help individuals kind of repair the relationships with their parents so that they can repair themselves, basically. And then the other thing that we look at uh, is the defensive processes and we code uh, Attachment theory is very simple in terms of defensive process. It's not this elaborate psychoanalytic model like some models. We, we code something called deactivation. Is the mind shifting the attention away or trying to make this less distressing? Uh, we code something called disconnection, which is like psychoanalytic splitting, which makes you really confused and you don't know really what's going on. And then we code for danger, which what we call the segregated system. He explains that the segregated system was a mid 20th century reformulation of psychoanalytic repression, basically. So we code all those. And then for the dyadic stories, you already have somebody there portrayed. So who are these people together? Uh, are they a married couple, which is assumed to be an attachment relationship? And if, if you're not just dating or you know, in a new relationship, uh, is it a grandmother and a child? Um, or is this often in one of the scenes, it's a, a nurse and they're in a hospital. So we're trying to see who the people are. And we code for something called synchrony. If you are in an attachment caregiving dyad, if the people in your picture are an attachment figure, a mother, father, grandfather, aunt, uncle, somebody on your biological continuum, and a child or a married couple, are you sensitive to each other? Are we, we're looking kind of in an Ainsworth way. What is, what is the sensitivity to your distress? Is there distress and is your attachment figure sensitive? Or another important part of attachment is mutual enjoyment. 
are you enjoying the intimacy of being together? Not in a sexual way for the couple necessarily, but in a, in a, we are together in this and it doesn't matter what we're doing. You know, we could be playing dominoes, but there, there's, there's a sparkle. I don't know how to describe it. You'd have to see it, but there's a sparkle to these stories that say, we're not just playing dominoes and playing, the, following the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, express, what, uh, express delight. Express right. delight, but, but these stories are really short. Yeah. You know, they're, they're maybe, by the time you go through the probes, they, you might have eight, nine, 10 lines of text. How do you get sparkle? <laughs> 10 lines of text. Mm -hmm. But this is what part of what we teach. And then we also code the, um, for the defenses that I said for the alone story. So you put all these together and you look at the pattern. And this is where we go back to Mary Ainsworth, the work of, it's always called patterns of attachment. Uh, we're not talking about personality per se. We're not, we can't associate attachment directly with any particular form of psychopathology. There are hints that attachment is related to certain kinds of personalities and psychopathologies. Um, and I think Bowlby would have been disappointed with that because he was really trying to go in that direction. But what we know now is these are patterns. And so you, you look at how all of these elements fit together and you ask yourself a basic question, several basic questions. What is the storyteller's representation of availability, sensitivity and responsiveness of attachment figures in this protocol? And also, are they connected to other people? What kind of defenses are there? And um, I think sometimes people expect people, individuals who tell quote unquote secure. And I, I want to move away from the terminology secure because that's not what we're talking about. Secure by the, by the secure, whether regardless of how old you are, means that you are flexible, you can take action. And as we move forward in our life, we can integrate. And this is very much along the line of Alan Shore's uh, emotion regulation, self-regulation. The parent is very much involved in that. But by the time we look at the AP, we're saying, you know, can you do this? And then do you have a representation of your parent helping you? Now, you may not have had a parent who could help you do that. But in terms of clinical work, the reason why we all do what we're doing is we're trying to get individuals to a place where they can do those kinds of functioning, they can regulate, they can go out in the world and take action, and they can think about attachment in a different way that gives them the tools to do that. We're not asking for forgiveness necessarily, but they think about attachment in a different way. So we use the word secure as a shorthand, but that's what it really means. And a, a lot of people expect those individuals that we call secure to be perfect. And, and one of the hardest things some of, for some of the trainees, because uh, there's a reliability process that takes place when you use this measure, that all of us who train work really hard to help people get. Um, wait, you, you learn so much. You learn that security is not perfection. That security means, you know what, I can do it. And I can be flexible about how I do it. I can think about it. I don't need to distract myself. I don't need to say, okay, well, this isn't important. I'll just go work on a work project, mm -hmm. which are some of the, the stories. I'm not, you know, I'm getting things out of stories. And so, mm -hmm. but does it happen all the time? No. Does it happen in all seven stories? No. And, and that's the hard part because we know that as clinicians, but when we're using assessments, we're often taught that there are standards, we, we are taught, you know, um, assessments are normed. Well, attachment is not normed. There's no attachment measure ever that is normed. We can tell you about certain populations of babies or certain populations of children or adult based on their experience, what we tend to see in those populations. But we don't have percentiles, we don't have norms. What we're looking at are as close to personality patterns as I would ever think I could say the word personality. Mm, that's it's, really great. it's not quite personality, but it, it's regulation. That's right. I love, and, you know, yeah. 
Go ahead. I was going to say, what are the norms for regulation? Well, your, your biology sets up the norms just the way that Alan Shore has described it, but we all, we, we all don't have the opportunity to receive those kinds of interactions. Yeah, that's true. And, and adapting to stay safe and keep the caregiver available as much as you can is health, right? It is, that is exactly. a good thing to do. Now you said something earlier, I just wanna run back to you really quickly because I can imagine people asking about this. You, you just kind of said it offhand that you said that the part of why we're doing this is um, it's, it's about the original parents. And I think you said, we wanna help repair the relationship with the parent. And I wanna, yeah, to clarify right. that. Um, well, the, the way attachment works and what the research has shown is, and I use the parent as a, a shorthand, that our attachment figures are the ones that set up the original capacities for regulation and, and stress management. Attachment is very much a, a regulatory and stress management. And it happens in relationships. And, it, and so attachment also, also sets up the rules for how we engage in other relationships right that I'm just something well I was just wondering because you said the parents and I'm imagining all these people that are doing adult therapy that have you know maybe have tried you know what all kinds of reasons that uh reorganizing with the actual parent would right. not necessarily be best for that person's exactly. growth right so I just wanted to right or, or the parent is dead the parent is gone or somebody was asking recently a really difficult question. How, how do we engage in the therapeutic process with a teenager? Because you can use the AP with, with teens as young as 14. Uh, when the teen is still living in the home. Right. And the parent is still, and I, I don't mean to be rude, but in their face. Yes, no. Just like babies in our face too. Even my puppy's in my face, right? <laughs> so, so what we're trying to do to do clinically, and we can use the AP to help us. The AP gives us a window into how we represent, how we think about attachment, and in relation to hypothetical attachment figures, which is actually a window into our regulatory processes. Right. So, so it's about updating our internal working models. Exactly. And yes. when we update and then when we develop some flexibility and when we develop some different ways of looking at something that even was traumatic for us, when we add uh, our ability to, to kind of modulate what's going on in our, our limbic system, mm -hmm. then we're starting to talk about security. Now, right. have we have we actually... Have we actually repaired the relationship with the physical parent? Not necessarily because some people can't do that. Sometimes forgiveness is not something that one even can do. But what one can do is widen one's own regulatory processes so yes. that when you encounter that parent, you don't flip out. Exactly. Okay, good. So I just wanted to, that's why yeah, I wanted sure. to roll back to that because uh, I could imagine it uh, throwing some people off, but right. So it's updating the model. It's updating the biology. It's getting back to integration and flexibility. Exactly. Um, with new safe relationships often. Uh, but and I'm wondering if this is a good time to segue into disorganization, just to sure. you say a little bit about disorganization. Yes, I know that you sure. really have studied this and, and, and we get questions all the time. And I think we get it wrong a lot. So so speak, tell us, <laughs> what, what should we know about this organization? Well, let me, let me uh, let's see, looking at the clock, we have time. Um, I think we have to understand how this organization what, uh, came to be. I don't like to use the word evolved unless we're talking about evolution, but how it developed, how it came to be, how it was discovered. And the, the seeds for, for what we now call disorganization were laid um, by many, many different uh, laboratories doing research using the strain situation. And what would happen is that using the framework that Mary Ainsworth had uh, developed, which is how we were all taught, there were babies that it didn't fit, it didn't work. And so as researchers, you can do two things that you can't do as clinicians. <laughs> You can throw that data out, not look at it. Tell, tell your client, go home, I can't, I can't help you. 
But as researchers, it's very common to take what we might call the oddballs and just move them away and not even treat them uh, in our analyses. Uh, you can do that. Or what they ended up doing more often than not, I believe more often, was saying, well, if I had to make a choice, if I really had to make a choice, where would I put that baby? And so it really took Mary Main and Judith Solomon to sit down with their videotapes. And then they got a lot of work from labs, colleagues across the nation and say, uh, we need to figure out what's going on here. And that's how disorganization uh, developed. That's how the term developed. And what disorganized means you have to be able to explain what organized means. So let me step over there for a minute and come back to disorganization. So the three attachment groups that people are most used to that we call in children, secure, avoidant, or ambivalent resistant, some people call them anxious, or in adults called secure, dismissing is like the avoidant and preoccupied is like the ambivalent resistant. All of those relationships are based on rules. They make sense. And those rules, uh, there's a beautiful paper by Mary Main uh, published in 1990. Those rules are based on, are given to us by our biology. And one rule, which is called primary, is you go directly to the parent, you say what you want, express your anger, you get comforted, and you're done with it. The, there are two other sets of rules that the insecure children and adults use, which are called secondary rules or strategies, biological strategies. Well, I can't go directly to you, but I can kind of stay just far enough near you, if that makes sense. And oh. that's voidant. And the other is, okay, I can't, it's just not okay for me to be direct. You don't like it. You don't hear me. I'll, I'll mew. And if you don't hear my mew, I'll, I'll frown, you know? And if you don't see my frown, I'll cry. And if you still don't see my cry, I'll scream. That's a closeness rule, but they are rules. And there are sacrifices with those secondary rules. You don't get what you need right away. Your biology doesn't get what it needs right away, but they work. And those relationships are called organized. So when the disorganized pattern was described, what Judith and Mary were seeing was that everybody has a set of rules. So we, we all are part of that, but those rules were being disrupted by big things. A baby who was about to approach a parent in a strange situation, making a beeline just stands there and freezes. What's that? Uh, a, a child goes and hides under the table or behind the door. What, what is that? You're not going to read about that in biology. So they, they called those behaviors disorganized because the rules were not working. This baby somewhere in there has a set of rules, but the rules were being disrupted. When I'm teaching my undergraduates, sometimes I'll say it's like a deck of cards. You just, th you know, cards have an order. You just throw them up in the air and they land and now you're out of order. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I say, you know, it's like the brake and the accelerator at the same time, you know. And, and we and saw that, mm -hmm. the approach avoidance behavior, mm -hmm. which and a lot of the, not a lot of it, but, but a good part of the material that Judith and Mary were working with came out of my child abuse study, where we we're watching children, young children, uh, 12 months to three years uh, in a daycare situation, approaching caregivers like this is like, and, and even approach, we were able to bring a few into the laboratory and do strange situations. Um, they were very generous, you know, to come and, and be with us. And you know, what is this? Or, or why, why is this, this mother is trying to, this happened in our laboratory, is trying to blow bubbles with her little girl. Why does her brother, her the little girl get a, like a look on her mouth, like she's going to bite her mother and whack the bubbles out of her. I mean, the bubbles went flying. I had Boy, did I have a cleaning job in the playroom. Where, where, where did that come from? You were, you were having a great time, little one. And now suddenly, whoo. So, so what, she, what she was just describing, because I can see her, is like, it's almost like a girl, like her teeth were exposed. It was almost oh, like a girl. She was going to bite. Yes. It's a, I think I still have that video somewhere. So, so where I want to go with that is that uh, Judith has continued, of course, to work on the topic of disorganization. That's where I came in because we were working in the same lab. And what 
we propose uh, is that disorganization describes babies in the strain situation, but it is not the word that we should be using to describe the phenomenon. The phenomenon that we propose that we should be using, the term is dysregulated. Because yes, the baby is, the rules aren't working, but what's happening is that they are emotionally dysregulated. They're, they're frightened, they're hiding, they're angry, um, you know, they're frozen. Uh, some babies have been observed to dissociate, babies do dissociate. Um, and so we, we wrote a chapter in our second disorganization book, Disorganized Caregiving, Attachment and Caregiving. Uh, the very first chapter is about looking at all the material that's out there about disorganization and saying that in, in our doll play and our caregiving interview that these uh, individuals are dysregulated, not just at the behavioral level, but they're dysregulated at the neurophysiological level, at the hormonal level. And that to say that this is disorganized doesn't really make sense anymore. One and two, another reason it doesn't make sense is that the majority of these babies grow up to be children who don't look like the babies. They are children who, who seize control over the reunion um, because they carry around, we now know from the children's doll play and from the AP, they carry around such uh, painful experiences of abandonment and isolation and being left and not protected by their parents, that the way Judith and I explain this is that when a child who as early as three, but certainly by five, um, takes on a controlling position with the parent, at the moment they're supposed to have reunification. And they can do that by being nasty to the parent. This is the punitive type. They can do that by being soothing to the parent. This is the caregiving type. Judith and I propose that the child is trying to remind the parent that they're actually supposed to be the stronger and wiser one in the relationship. And parents react to that, especially if your child's being rude. Yeah, mm -mm -mm -mm. No, this isn't going to happen. So how, you, they're not disorganized. In fact, I think Pat Crittenton has, has written a lot about how these controlling strategies are not disorganized at all. They are hyper controlling strategies, but the doll play very clearly showed Judith and I that underneath these inside, these children who were controlling their parents on reunion, their doll plays were absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. So they, you could see that what um, some people are calling the multiple selves. You've got the outdoor self and then you've got the inside self and they, there was no integration, there's no regulation. So what we see in the AEP, um, oh, it's, it's fabulous what we can see in the AEP is, uh, so we're unlocking their defenses and one set of defenses is the segregated system that John Bowlby suggested was repressed trauma. Um, could be conscious or unconscious, but it's coming out of the AP in a hypothetical story, unless a person decides to tell us their story. Every once in a while, someone does. That's treated a little differently. But the what we look at is, um, we, we look at these evidences in the story. So if the little boy in the corner is said that he is being abused, that's trauma. Okay, and, and we look at this across all the stories and we were a, able to see and we color code and this is a red for alert and we call you can see how the trauma pervades either one story or the whole transcript or maybe just a tidbit just a little bit of coding and that really gives you a, a literally a picture a color picture of what's happening inside the person's mind so what we've, we've done with that, so we don't call that disorganization, people still want to. But following the AAI, we determine, Mary May came up with a term called resolved. Well, if you are using defenses to kind of just contain your trauma, that's not resolved. Not the way that people study trauma use it. But you're containing it and saying, okay, Push comes to shove, we see the, we see the uh, trauma in the transcript. 
you know that your client has some organizing defenses and will try to use them. Whereas the unresolved person, again, following the AI, can, has, tries to use organizing defenses, but they're flooded and they become totally dysregulated. So that is how we've moved to, from disorganization to dysregulation in the AAP. And then the thing that has happened most recent, two recent things in the AAP with trauma. One is that we are able now to assess John Bowlby's other forms of mourning, which you referred to earlier, failed mourning or failure to mourn and preoccupy with personal suffering. Preoccupy with personal suffering is a form of chronic mourning like unresolved. And Bowlby talks about these at length in his 1980 volume. Failed mourning hasn't received much attention and it's big where someone has created armor around their trauma. They, they don't wanna go there, they don't wanna talk about it. They might eat, not even consciously realize how much is affecting it, them. It comes out in the AEP. And boy, when you break that open clinically, you've got a volcano in many ways. You've got a volcano, but also, you know, what's so lovely as a clinician is on the other side of that volcano, you have more regulation and you have right. more, you know, more of that integration. Um, but you have to break, you have to break it open first. You have to break it open and, and, um, and you, you chip at it away very yeah. gently. And, mm -hmm. um, my, my young colleague, Melissa Lehman is becoming an expert, a clinical expert in treating failed mourning. We don't talk about it in the field of attachment because nobody could assess it. There's one paper on failed mourning that Avisagi Schwartz in Israel published, um, from, from the Holocaust in, in, in Israel. Um, and it's more of a case study. It, it, it doesn't really have much, um, it, it's, it's a lovely paper, but it doesn't say a whole lot. That's it. Mm -hmm. And people will say to me, because I do a lot of clinical consult consultation, where can I read more about this? I said, well, you can read Bowlby 1980 and you can read the AP book and that's it. So we, we did a, a seminar, the American trainers and I did a seminar in June on these different kinds of what Bowlby calls incomplete pathological mourning. And he calls it pathological mourning because these are the forms of mourning that he found in his clients in the middle of the 20th century, and that's still true, um, to have the most psychiatric distress. And in the AP, what we're finding, because he, Bowlby was interested in loss, but we're interested in all kinds of threats, traumatic threats to the relationship. Uh, we too are finding that this is associated, these forms of mourning are associated with psychiatric distress, but the failed mourning people don't want to tell you that. Mm -hmm. So when you use paper and pencil to find out like the, you know, like the, uh, looking they're going to look, yeah, they're going to look pretty good. Are they, oh, the MMPI, they all look great. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. problem on the MMPI. Or on the ECT, a lot of people take those, you know, um, the, oh, which speaking of, could you say just a quick word about the difference between those adult attachment and the social science research that most people, that's what you can Google and find and get a, um, a questionnaire and answer it. Sure. Right. Uh, versus the developmental works. So we call ours developmental assessments because there is a large literature of, of 55 plus years linking what happens with a baby to what's happening as an adult. And there's some good longitudinal studies and then lots of cross-sectional studies. And um, around the time, right after I was uh, working on the AAI and, and that when that was happening, um, a, a scholar at UC Davis by the name of uh, Phil Shaver um, became interested in studying loneliness. He, he's a social psychologist. So the questionnaires that you're referring to are social psychology questionnaires. Um, they became entitled attachment style and ours are called attachment pattern attachment status. So Phil was interested in um, the history of loneliness and got turned on with Mary Ainsworth's three groups or three baby groups. And he and another colleague, um, uh, Hazan, Cindy Hazan, uh, developed a questionnaire and it was a three item questionnaire and, and it was a little summary of each of the groups. And then he put those in popular women's magazines and around other places. And you were to check the box and then send it back to him. Who are you? Check the box. And so what they report is that the percentages of people who checked the boxes of these three groups 
pretty much matched Mary Ainsworth's babies that she had studied the percentages she reported in the 1960s. And what we have discovered since, and I, I've done some of this research, not published, but I have worked on projects, is that the paper and the argument is that these paper and pencil questionnaires, which I don't think anybody uses the three box check version anymore. It's more sophisticated now. Yeah. Well, they, you know, social psychologists are fabulous statisticians. <laughs> Developmentalists, maybe not so much, but social psychologists are amazing statisticians. And so people developed questionnaires that had lots of items and they did factor analysis and they did all the empirical validation, lots of questions. Uh, one is called the, the early Early close relationships. Yeah, scale, that's the one like I was referring the ECR. to. The yeah, ECR. Yeah, yeah, experiences. Experiences and close mm -hmm. relationships. There mm -hmm. you go. That's right. Yeah. But the pro there are two problems with that. One is empirical and one is psychological. I'll address the psychological one first. Um, there, there is no established association with early in your life. There, the, the, now, this is where you have norms and you have percentages, and all. these were, were developed. Uh, and and what I want to say came came to their magnificence by asking college students to talk about their romantic relationship. They had to be in a dating relationship over a certain amount of time. Because truly, as we grow older and we develop relationships with adults, those adults become attachment figures also. But these were not stable attachment figures. These were dating relationships. That's one problem. The other problem is that people don't report honestly. And maybe they were reporting honestly about their, their sweethearts. Uh, but we also know, because I did a study with a grad student where we had the some version of one of those um, assessments and AAIs, uh, people are not honest. And the people who love to say that they're secure the most are people who are dismissing. Thanks. I was just going to say that, yeah, we're notoriously bad at guessing our actual developmental attachment style. <laughs> or, or do you want to say, or are, and I'm not saying they're lying. I'm saying they're defen dismissing defenses are so powerful. They tell believe what, it. They believe it. Well, I'll tell you, if, if you had to give me a set of defenses and I had to choose, give me dismissing. Oh, I've always said that. <laughs> I totally, that's right. Saves you a lot of grief. <laughs> so... The, the, but I, the story I was going to tell you very quickly is that, um, so a couple of years ago, I was at the attachment conference and, and I'll name names here because people were there and they know, they know, uh, they heard the conversation. Uh, and a colleague of mine, uh, older, older colleague, Maury Mary Mays generation, uh, Phil, Phil and Carolyn Cowan, who do wonderful work, uh, had, were presenting a study uh, of adults and they used I don't remember the attachment style measure they used. It might've been the ECR, but they used one of those measures. And I don't quite remember, you know, it was a, a symposium. So I didn't, don't remember all the details, but I do remember I raised my hand and they acknowledged and they know me. And I raised my hand and I stood up and I asked a question about their study. And the first thing Phil said, Phil said, and I wasn't asking, why didn't you use the AEI? You were just downstairs on the second floor with us up on the third floor. And it wasn't my point. And he said, I didn't use the AAI in the study because this study is about romantic relationships. And I replied to him, I said, Phil, that's perfect because that's what this measure measures and the AAI doesn't measure that. And then I could ask my question. Um, but so for all, those of you who are out there, if you want to assess romantic relationships, try out these questionnaires, but you are not going to be able to use these questionnaires and get a picture of what one's developmental history is in terms of the, the rubrics and the nomenclatures of attachment, developmental yeah. attachment. And this is so important because those things happen to us before we have narrative consciousness, you know, mem autobiographical memory. So we can't self-report them. And you have to have these things that you get at the unconscious, like your, um, inventory, um, like anything that gets around the unconscious or the, um, all the defenses that we have at seeing this. Try it, to, or see right. through them. That's so right, that's right. That, that leads me to the other, the most recent uh, development using the AP is that Judith Solomon and I are working on a shame project. And attachment has never said anything about shame. 
And yet we all know in the clinical world, shame is really big right now. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it is really big. Um, and, and people are talking about shame and they're talking about toxic shame. And there's some lovely psychoanalytic articles and neurophysiological articles about shame. How do you measure it? And there, there are shame questionnaires and they run into the same problems that you would get with the attachment style questionnaires. What are you going to report on? Because shame is so painful, especially toxic shame. So the approach that Judith and I are taking uh, is that shame is part of socialization. Even Eric Erickson told us that in the second crisis, it's autonomy versus shame or doubt. Parents use shame, society uses shame. So what we have now that is percolating and it's pretty good is a coding system for shame. We only looked at the corner picture though, because the corner picture is the picture. I, I looked at several hundred AEPs. The corner picture is the one that talks about parent-child conflict. And that's where shame starts, is in parent socialization. And so we haven't finished, uh, stay tuned. We haven't finished analyzing the data yet. But the point to be brought out here is now that when I do consultation with the AEP, I'm able to do shame coding. Oh, wow, that's and great. I'm able to point out uh, in not just in the corner story, but other stories, because a lot of shame in some stories are about peers, not about parents. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to point out um, shame indicators in the AP, drawing on the literature, including a projective on shame, but, but the projector doesn't have anything to do with attachment. But I put a lot of things together. Um, borrowed with permission from, from people and borrowed from Darwin. And, and so we have a system to see shame. And recently I, I sent a coding to a client, a clinical person that I was consulting for. And um, she said, wow, I never even thought about shame with this client. And now I'm going to explore that with her. Mm -hmm. um, it helps fine tune it. <laughs> Would you well, mind? Opens okay. it up at least. Oh, Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, I'm aware of the time and I know it's, it's shrinking here. So I just keep wanting to like uh, pull on you. Uh, I thought maybe I was trying to think of like, like to ground this. What You, you mentioned again with shame, the corner um, picture, right? The person in the yeah. corner. Would you mind just quickly like, okay, what would a, what we would traditionally call secure, you know, an integrated, uh, example be what would a dismissive you know what I mean like we can use the one sure. thing and just give examples so that I think that'll help people understand what you're sure getting. a person who is secure is integrated and like the baby this person is going to tell you that they are distressed when they're in, in these more intense pictures the first picture is not um, quite so distressing but the secure person is going to tell you that there's there's something there that ha you have to do something about and I'm going to just use some things for a minute um it, it might you know, it, it might be breakfast for this child or it might be I just coded a um a, an AP from Japan um somebody brought this child to the room and she stuck what is she going to do about it and so an individual who is secure more times than not will tell you what the problem is and then they will either think about it. I mean, not just reflect, but they will think about it or they will reach out to an attachment figure when they're alone, these are alone and, and the attachment figure will soothe them. And you'll see in the dyadic stories, a person who is flexible, who is secure, has some basic representation of either sensitivity from an attachment figure or mutual enjoyment. So as you look at all of the codes, that's primarily what you're gonna see. Are you gonna see trauma? You could. Okay. So they would They're, recognize that the child is upset. They, they, they don't yeah. have to push that information out, but there's a solution there, there is that makes there, sense. There's, in the, there's more than a solution. There is what some, it, it's not quite reflective functioning, but there is this ability to really think about it. Not just say, okay, how am I going to solve this problem? I'm going to do X, Y, C, and D. Mm -hmm. 
but to, to kind of, you see part of the internal process. Engage with it. Engage with it, or the attachment figure and the dyadic pictures are, are sensitive or in mutual responsiveness. And um, again, uh, people who are secure have trauma. Right. It's just they're able, they're able to, to regulate it mm -hmm. and are flexible. A person who is dismissing is shifting attention in the story themes and through defenses away from attachment to stress. You can do that by focusing on what you do in your life, achievement, buying things. So if they're looking at that picture, they might say, he's at school and he failed a test. And he knows that, uh, he knows that he didn't cheat and he, I, I can only come up with a secure story. <laughs> and, and so he, this is on the bench. He failed a test, he's at school. He knows he didn't cheat. Um, he's gonna go hang out with his friends. <laughs> what did you do about the test? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Woo! You can try say the mind went woo. Right. right. Um, Deactivating. The the other thing that happens with the dismissing people is they actually, I want to use the word leak. What Judith and I saw with the caregiving interviews, the mothers of avoidant children. The mothers of avoidant children uh, would frequently evaluate their children as sort of just trying to get something, manipulate. So, more than anything else. I mean, we're not saying once, I'm just saying as a pattern. So in the AP, we often see uh, the person negatively evaluating themselves, like failing a test as a negative evaluation. Oh, interesting. So this, this under layer of, of, of not being accepted is leaks out in DI. It's not just a nice, cool wall they built about. Um, the person who is preoccupied because the main defense is, is a splitting um, is confused. Uh, on the AP usually tells um, stories that don't, you don't know who the characters are, you don't know what the storyline is, or they choose several. I mean, they're, they're just sort of all over the place, but they, they still kind of hang together. Um, they, they, the deactivator, the dismissing person is all about events. The preoccupied person is all about emotions. So you tend to see more about the frustration, anger, uh, confusion, um, a lot of sentimentality often in the, in the cemetery story in particular, uh, but it's all about emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard, there was some term you used at some point. I have to bounce off at one. Okay. Um, so just, I was, I'm aware that we're kind of pushing up against that. Sure. You just tell I me. Could, I could talk to you for another hour. Easily. <laughs> well, we do but have to bring this to, I know, I know. So, um, exactly. So that's why I wanted to say it off to the side yeah. of like, um, sure. I didn't want you to, um, uh, is there a quick unresolved, um, yes, there is a story quick. to the, to the, okay. Yes. The, the unresolved individual can look like any of those people I just described. But when attachment trauma enters just one story, unbelievable, just one story, they are not able to regulate. They are not able to, there's no agency. Uh, nobody comes along, not even a stranger comes along and helps them. And in the, uh, in the dyadic stories, for example, there's a scene with a bed, the child is frightened, he had a nightmare, um, or mom and dad just said they were gonna have a divorce and the, and the child is just, overwhelmed and the parent just leaves the room. So what happens in the unresolved is that you have these stories, many of the elements of the stories are similar, like I just said, to the stories I described earlier. But when the segregated system appears in the story, it is not managed. It, it, they're, they're left flooded by it. So that's what it kind of looks like. That, um, I am so sorry to not, be able to just continue to pick your pick your brain. I know what I imagine is going to happen with this podcast is that we sometimes form study groups, little study pods of just nice. yeah, either either a book or sometimes an episode. This is has so much in it that I imagine my community of neuro nerds will like to come together and talk about it. And um, 
And for all of you who are interested in actually studying more directly with Dr. George, um, I, I imagine there'll be people who want to get an AAP on themselves, clinicians that want to uh, get AAPs on their clients. So where, where would you like to direct them? So um, the general place to direct you to is the Adult Attachment Projective website. Just put that in your search engine. Adult Attachment Projective. Don't put in AAP, you get a pediatrician. <laughs> Um, and is it okay with you if I, if I, in the show notes, add some of the pictures since they're public, or should I not do that? The pictures uh, you, that we've you, spoken of. You can, uh, how about if I send you the ones that we usually do for demos? Okay, great. Um, so go to that website and it gives you information about the books. It gives you information about the uh, U.S. trainers and other trainers around the world. It gives you information about our trainings, but it also gives you the email where you can reach me. Um, and that email is just called AAP info. We're part of the Comcast system. So it's AAP info at Comcast.net for those of you who might have a pencil handy, but it's all, uh, it's all on the website. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions to, uh, there's also papers. There's a whole library of um, papers that have been published and also an anthology with abstracts of papers, mostly up to date. I haven't freshened it in six months, but that's pretty good. Um, really good. Things that you can read the abstracts of, look at validity, look at how it's being used. Increasing numbers of people are using the AP clinically because it is accessible. We, we have a, um, some momentum now. There is a book on clinical application of the attachment projective that should be out next year. When it is out, it will be on the website, of course, where uh, very talented clinicians are in the process right now of contributing uh, case studies and how they've worked with the case studies and very importantly, how they are speaking to their clients about attachment and the assessment result. That is one of the big mysteries right now. It's fantastic. You, all yeah. this information, how do you mm -hmm. tell your client? That's right. How do you, you yeah, you, we don't want them uh, like a lab rat underneath, you know. Right, right. Exam, and the like, but how do you use yeah. it? Um, yeah. And the language that we use in research, we have to be very careful. That, oh, that's totally. sterile language, but there is language. Well, that even in our know. conversation today. Yes. Right. That, um, so, uh, you know, just hearing it from that perspective, if there was anything that was, you know, more research oriented, that that's why, because, you know, it's like study, studying it um, versus the clinical side of it. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Um, well, I imagine if it's okay with you that I would be in touch, um, just we'll certainly follow up when the episode comes out. Um, and I don't, I just, I cannot thank you enough for oh, spending this time with us and being so generous. Um, and we're gonna try to grab those resources that you mentioned, some of the uh, people that, um, uh, the, the papers and the people that you've worked with, you know what I mean? I want, I want the show notes for this note, for this episode to be really rich so that those who are interested can link to the original people. Oh my, oh my. Right. And that's something that we really pride ourselves on doing is, um, trying to make it understandable, but then also those of you that want more, you know, being able to link you directly. So, right. Great. Um, well, I do consultation groups with the AP. You have, you have to be through training, but, um, but really I, I am a retired person and I have time and I will, I'm nice to meet all of you. I don't be careful what you say because well, <laughs> reach, reach out. Um, and if I good, can help, if I can that. help, I can. And if I can't, I will send you elsewhere. Yeah, that is so great. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. George. And uh, this is going to be our launch for our next season. It'll probably come out um, end of September, early October, but it's, we're going to, hit the ground running with it so great great I look okay forward to it. Thank, all right thank you so bye. much appreciate bye -bye it now. okay